Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Jane Horrocks. Jane is an actress, singer and comedian who's been lighting up British stages and screens for more than 30 years. Proudly born and raised in Lancashire, she charmed the nation as Bubble in TV sitcom Absolutely Fabulous and has starred in films including Life is Sweet, Little Voice and Sunshine on Leaf. In 2020, you'll be able to see her as a paramedic in Sky One comedy Bloods. Jane Horrocks, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'd like to us to begin, Jane, today, if you could tell us about a significant bereavement you've experienced in your life. I think the most significant bereavement was my dad, who died eight years ago. And um, I, I didn't think I was that close to my dad. But when he died, um, it was such a, a profound moment for me that um, it's kind of undescribable and and very difficult to prepare for losing a parent. And um, I think that that was uh, quite shocking to me, actually, how um, devastated I was by losing my dad when I thought I was kind of all right, you know, about him going. But when it happened, it was, yeah, it was profound. So the thought of it beforehand, you thought, well, I'm going to be able to manage this and I feel okay about it. Um, But then when it happened, it was a different story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. My mum, who's got Alzheimer's um, and is in a nursing home and um, doesn't really know who I am, is, um, I don't know how long she's going to last. I mean, I didn't know how long my dad was going to last. He ended up in a nursing home as well with uh, Parkinson's and dementia. Doesn't bode well for me, does it? (laughs) uh, uh, It's funny because I feel like I've already lost my mum through Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, and I I kind of feel the same way about my mum that... I think I, I'm going to be able to cope with it because I already feel like I've lost her anyway. But I know that that's probably not going to be the reality. And um, and there is a certain dread when that day comes when I am going to lose my mum and that profound effect happens again, which is so out of your control. And, um, yeah, kind of um, otherworldly. Mm-hmm. Some of those losses that come with dementia, which I've heard people talk about before, can you talk a bit about that, you know, a bit about what that is like for your mum and for you? Well, um, I think because my my dad um, had Parkinson's and then then got dementia and he didn't last very long with the dementia. Um, And I don't, and I think I've been living longer with my mum and dementia. Um, than I was with my dad. So I think it's really kind of... um, I've absorbed it a lot more with my mum than I did with my dad. And uh, and it was much more of a gradual process with my mum as well, whereas it seemed to be very rapid with my dad. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, it's very strange. I often refer to my mum in the past that she's not alive anymore. So that's a very strange thing. Um, people correct me and say, hang on a minute, I, I didn't realise you, your mum had died. And I go, oh, no, no, she's not. No, gosh, yes, I don't know why I'm speaking of her in the past tense. But, I, yeah, I mean, it's looking back at videos. I'm in the process of making a little art film about my mum with old footage that I've got of her. and uh, And to think that that person isn't 
with me anymore mm. is, you know, is is pretty awful. I kind of have to put up a really strong barrier to deal with it. Um, I'm 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 in the process of moving house as well, and lots of things have changed recently in my life that I've kind of thrown everything up in the air um, to see how things land. And I, I think it is a direct result of my mum having Alzheimer's. Why do you think that is? Um, I think because the loss of somebody so important in my life mm-hmm. is, well, you know, sod it. Why not? Why not just actually take massive risks now? Because that rock that was in my life is no longer there anymore. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, but I'm wondering if there's something about both parents as well. So your mum's the second person to go. She's not gone. She mm. hasn't died. Mm. She hasn't physically died. But you've lost the mum you remembered, like you were just mm. telling us about, mm. the mum in the video clips. I wonder, I don't know, whether there's a link between having both parents and then having none. Um, in yes. that chucking everything up in the air yes, thing. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, I, I'm in effect, I've been orphaned, yeah. So even though my mum is still alive, I do feel like I, yeah, I am quite, a, quite an orphan now. What do you think about that word, orphan? Um, I, I sort of find it an interesting one. The first thing I think about is Annie. And it, mm. it, it kind of makes no sense mm. to me. Um, both my parents have died. And, and... I find it a funny one, but people will often say it. Mm. Um, I suppose. I suppose it, it makes it makes me feel a bit rootless. I suppose, right. and desperate to find something that's grounding. Even though I am moving house, I suppose I'm kind of in search of new roots and new beginnings, mm. so that I can put all that past in the past, and um, yeah, kind of move forward in a in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I had a. Uh, she, my mum wasn't well recently. She she had pneumonia and ended up in hospital, and um, and I really thought that it was my mum coming to an end, and um, and she didn't. She miraculously recovered, and she's uh, back in the the nursing home now, um, and um, I'm being very well looked after. They've kind of brought her back, but they brought her back to what they know not what I know and um, that's uh, yeah I mean I had a dream that she was ill with something like pneumonia but she still had her brain and we were able to I was able to talk to her about feeling ill and um, and that was a really strange dream because when I woke up I thought I would not be able to have that conversation with her about feeling ill mm. so there's something that you you feel quite useless and, um, you know, not really of service to them anymore. Uh, when my mum, when the, the first signs of Alzheimer's started, I did try and encourage her to open up her life and do sort of things that might stimulate her brain, um, which she rejected, actually, and sort of withdrew from society um, and um, became very, very insular. And, um, and I think I felt a great frustration about that, that um, she didn't want my help or she didn't, she, was, she didn't want to do that. And that was her journey and I've come to terms with that now, that that was her decision and it's her journey. Um, but um, I think there was a, a great frustration and a point where I, I just thought, well, actually this is, this is my mum's life and, and she can choose how she wants to end it I suppose which is um, you know and it is the gradual journey towards the end that she's taking right now but uh, yeah I think it, it's, it's it's this feeling of redundancy mm-hmm. which I know she felt as a mother as well when I when she felt re- redundant as a mother and I feel redundant as a daughter now What do you do with that? What do you do with that feeling? What do you do with that redundancy? Um, I try um and invest it in my children. Mm. Um, yeah, I've got a son and a daughter. And, um, I mean, not in an overbearing way, because my mum and my dad um, gave me a, a fantastic sense of freedom. Freedom was a really big thing. And I, in turn, want to pass that on to my children. 
um, that they don't feel that they have to keep coming running back to see how I am, <laughs> that they're going to get on with their lives and, and brilliant. Mm. I'd like to go back to talking about your dad in a minute, but first, can I ask, can you tell me about your mum? What kind of woman was she before um, she was ill? My mum was a very vibrant woman. She uh, grew up in a little northern town called Rottenstall in Lancashire. Um, and uh, even though she had strict parents, she got away with a lot. <laughs> she was the second child. Uh, my auntie talks vividly about um, their upbringing and that she she did get away with a lot. Um, and she was wild, actually, a wild woman. And, um, you know, like dancing, like, like the men and... Um, was very, very vivacious and uh, full of fun and life and positivity. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, very, very fond memories of her. And we, uh, me, she and my dad spent a lot of time together, you know, before I got a family of my own. You know, I used to go on holiday with them and, you know, if there was a premiere of anything, they would be invited, you know. Um, they were very involved in my life. And they absolutely loved it, you know, they they really, um, yeah, it was um, a big bonus in their life. Fantastic. <laughs> so just going back to your dad and his illness, mm. or when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, is that something you spoke about as a family? Is it something he spoke about? So death and dying, his future? Um, no, no, we didn't speak about it. Um no, uh, I mean my my mum was quite um, a, quite a forceful woman as well. So my dad was one of those men that never got a word in edgeways um, and withdrew, you know, and sort of was very much in the background. Uh, whenever I'd call home, I'd ask to speak to my mum, which is terrible for my dad. But you know that was the relationship that it it just became that. Mm. Um, so I didn't have kind of deep conversations with my dad, um, sadly. And I think that th- that generation possibly don't want to talk about death because they find it very morbid and perhaps they don't think it's going to happen to them. I did try and talk about my mum's wishes and she always said, oh, let's not talk about it. that. It's so morbid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't get very far, to be honest. Um, you know, what I'm glad of is, I, you know, I did have my last special visit with my dad before he died, which was about three weeks before he died. And uh, he was a great Frank Sinatra lover and um, and they were playing Frank Sinatra in the home that he was in. And um, even though it seemed like he wasn't there and um, he had his eyes closed, I think on a... Uh, his higher self was there, and um, it it was it was it was a really special thing that we experienced. And I talked about that at the funeral, and um, yeah, and so I, I I feel that I did have closure with my dad because of that particular time. And and I actually asked my mum not to come with me on that visit because she always used to come on with me on the visits, and she always used to. You know, if I took music in or photographs, she wouldn't let my dad listen to the music. She'd talk all over it or she, you know, kind of would not give him time to look at the photographs and tell me, you know, and if he said, I remember him looking at me as a bridesmaid and saying that that was him. And, you know, my mum sort of laughed at him for that. And whereas, I, I, you know, I think I wanted to deal with it in a... I don't know, just allow him to be able to speak and if he got it wrong, it didn't matter. Mm. Um, So I, I, on the final visit, I said to my mum, I wanted to go on my own and I'm so glad that I did because it was just me and my dad. Um, And um, and I do feel that was a real real good point of closure for me and him. Mm. Uh, With my mum, I, I... I mean, before she, you know, the Alzheimer's really kicked in, I sent her um, a letter of appreciation and just listed all the things that I was really appreciative of. And I know that meant a massive amount to her. And she wrote one back to me. And so I've still got those letters. How lovely. Yeah. Um, and, And so I think that to be able to do those things for your parents before they do 
deteriorate is, well, on a personal level, that really meant a lot mm. f- for me to be able to do that and um, and that be acknowledged. And and I like I say with my dad, even though he seemingly wasn't there, I think he was there and I think he acknowledged that I was there. Every day and night, Marie Curie nurses and frontline staff give vital support to dying people and their families. We rely on the generosity of the public to deliver our care, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, our fundraising activities are grinding to a halt. We urgently need you to donate today. Visit mariecurie.org.uk forward slash donate. Did your dad, I know he didn't talk about death and dying, did he talk about his funeral? Because sometimes people will talk about funerals, but nothing else. No, and again, I, I don't think any of us encouraged him to talk about his funeral. So, I mean, that was that was quite complicated because my mum wanted me to do a reading at the funeral and I didn't want to do a reading because I knew my dad liked music and I wanted to talk about this last visit that I had with him. Mm-hmm. And um, and I know that that kind of, that was, it felt like it was a source of irritation to my brothers and my mum. Um, and I, I subsequently, I did try and talk to my mum about her funeral and what she would like. And again, she she didn't want to talk about it. So we can only second guess what she would have liked because now we can't ask her because she won't be able to answer. Um, so it's, I think it is definitely worth discussing what, what you would like. I've certainly put it in my will, what I right. want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we talk about that in our work. So for those very reasons... You know, it's a practical thing. Sometimes it's a it's a great conversation starter when you mm. want to talk about death and dying by actually talking about a funeral. Sometimes can be quite an easy way in. Not for everybody. And of course, some people are going to say, I don't want to talk about it. It's too morbid. Mm. But, um, you know, when we don't know what somebody wants, what their wishes are, whether they want to be buried or cremated, then you're left with family who might all have different opinions Mm -hmm. about what the day should be like or the ceremony or um, trying to work together to to, to get it right, you know. And, And then what can sometimes happen is sometimes people are left with difficult feelings afterwards that was it right or should I have gone with what mum said or um, so and when you're grieving you don't need any more difficult no. feelings mm. to add on top so yeah it can be incredibly helpful to do some of that planning mm. another thing as well we talk to people about which can be another good way into having some of the conversations about financial planning so has somebody written a will mm-hmm. um, in our work you know ne- nearly everybody we meet we, we have that conversation with but again, people are funny at talking about wills because there's the money thing, but also, well, a will means you're going to die. Yes. Yeah, I think I've, um, I, I, I don't, well, I, how I feel at the moment, I don't fear death in, and I don't mind talking about it. So writing a will to me is, is, um, is just a practical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it, when it comes to it, I might fear death. <laughs> Well, I was going to move on to that, so that's a lovely link. And what we know is when people are faced with bereavement loss, when they're caring for somebody who's living with a terminal illness, they're often faced with their own mortality. And I wanted to ask you if you thought about your own death. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do quite a lot, actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean... when I hear that somebody's passed away, I mean, somebody say in the public eye, I don't feel massive sadness because I um, I feel that if you've led a life of quality, it doesn't matter how long it is, as long as it's been a quality life. And that's what I think about my mum and dad. I think their, the majority of their life was quality. And, and really... It would be great if my mum could just go because she's not leading any quality of life at the moment. Um, She's been well looked after and she's been given love. But 
if she was to see herself in that state, I think she would say, actually, I don't want to be here. I don't want this. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think of, of legacies, you know, when people were sad about David Bowie dying, for example. I thought, well, what a legacy. You know, he's left so much behind. So absolutely brilliant. Rejoice in that. And I think there's sometimes the sadness of somebody departing overtakes the actual joy of what their life has been. Um, the you know to to celebrate their life and actually say, well, they were a brilliant person and they achieved this, that, and the other, or they were a kind person and they show great kindness to people all through their lives or whatever. You know, it's. Um, I think that for me, it's it's about the quality of your your life, not the longevity of it. Is thinking about death something that has been for you since your dad died? Or did you think about death when you were younger? Did you think about death before recently? Um, yes, I've often um, questioned the point of it all. And, um, yeah, I mean, and when you get to a point in your life where... It, I've certainly feel like I this a lot of the time <laughs> that I've, I've kind of done what I wanted to do. I then think, well, what is the next stage? And is that going to be as fulfilling? Uh, I mean, I think this world is such a world for young people. And there's uh, there's just not the same for old people out there. Uh, well, you have to really fight for it if you do want it. And uh, I just, yeah, I I sometimes find that a bit of a crushing bore. <laughs> so what, the thought of getting older? The thought of getting older and just, you know, your body um, not being as able and your mind not being as able. Uh, yeah, those, those th thoughts that, you know... Obviously, you try and do things. I mean, with both my parents having suffered from dementia, um, I think, you know, what can I do to postpone that happening to me? Mm. And uh, so I play a lot of table tennis <laughs> mm. <laughs> and try and try and do things that are um, quite stimulating. Obviously, being an actor and having to learn lines and coming, remembering those lines every night is, is another way of stimulating the brain. But, you know, anybody, you know, can get Alzheimer's. It's, um, you know, people who do stimulate their brains throughout their life can still get Alzheimer's. So um, there's Maybe no, even table tennis players. <laughs> yes. So there's no guarantee that I wouldn't get it even if I am playing table tennis every day and mm. every night. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um yeah, it's kind of, um, when I see um, where my dad ended up and where my mum is now, I I think of the future as being quite bleak In as I get older. I mean, to, you know, kind of in my 80s, if I get, get that far. Um, and it's not just, you know, even if you don't have that, my, my auntie, whose brain is very acute and, um, you know, she's... Yeah, she's as bright as she ever was. I feel sadness for her because all her friends are dying around her or have died. Mm -hmm. So there's a real sense of loneliness there and also a real fear for her when she sees her sister who's eight years younger than her um, in, you know, the midst of Alzheimer's and she can no longer communicate with her sister who she's known all her life. It's, um, I just... I, how do people cope with that? How do you know? I mean, it's it's bad enough for us as my mum's children, but her sister who has known her since she was born, um, I think that must be very difficult. So I've yeah, I just I I I, I find it hard to put a positive spin on getting to that age. I was interested in what you said before. There's, I think there's something difficult about moving into the new. So that kind of new way of being. You spoke about your mum going into hospital, not being well, coming out. The staff in the care home kind of, 
I'm not celebrating, but you mm. know, she'd done well. She was back home. They've only known her for a short mm. time. So they'd probably be able to list off. If I said to them, what's her quality of life? They'd probably be able to list off all the things that they they, they might see yes. as quality of life for her. But for you, who is not like them, adapting to a new... Well, they're not adapting to a new, mm. they've just met her, so it is new. Mm. But how do you do that as a daughter? How do you see what they're seeing? Um, well, and that's a hard bit, I yes. think, isn't it? I mean, and that is, you know, that is a lovely thing because when my mum went into the home, um, the manageress there said she's part of our family now. She's coming to our family now, which I thought was a really lovely thing. Mm. So it was a new stage of life for my mum that she had this new family that we're all embracing. Um, and when she was in hospital with pneumonia, um you know, they, you know, all the staff were saying we want her to come home now. We want to get her home, and then we can nurse her back to to better health, and um, which was a really lovely thing. And indeed, they did get her back, and indeed, they did nurse her back to better health, and she's getting better day by day. Um, and you know, and they tell me of the things that are coming back. She doesn't like noise, so she's always shushing people. So it's, um, you know, they say, oh, she's back to shushing people. And, you know, and so they see little quirks in her, mm -hmm. which are reminiscent of what she used to be. But, yeah, I mean, when I look at the other uh, residents as well and um, uh, and see their little individual quirks as I suppose their children might not see them in the same way that I see them because I don't know these people so I'm seeing them as being sort of either comical or lovely or a real person there mm -hmm. which perhaps their children don't see mm -hmm. uh, but yes it's um, absolutely to, to celebrate what carers do um, for for people who suffer from these illnesses is is absolutely amazing, and um, and knowing that they're safe is also a really reassuring thing. Mm. But I think ultimately it's hard, and watching it's hard, and it's not nice. And if it goes on for a long time, it can be very difficult and very painful at times. Yes. And it's difficult to know what to do when people say, well, do you want to take some music in or do you want to take like photographs or you know, talk, talk about certain things? It's very difficult to know what to do with my mum because she's so far gone down the Alzheimer's road that those things don't register at all now. Just going back to you, you thinking about your own death, I wanted to ask whether you not only thought about it but also talked about it. So... Uh, you know, you said that you've put your funeral wishes mm. into your will. And for people listening, if you didn't know you could do that, you can. Um, <laughs> you know, you can put in kind of the, certainly the basics yep. of what you want and you can include that in your will. And I think it's a really good thing to do. Um, and where you want your ashes scattered as well. And if where you're you cremated. want your ashes yeah. scattered, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've done mine as well. And I've put where <laughs> I want my ashes <laughs> scattered. Mm. Um, is it something you've spoken about with your family, with your children? Um, I mean, I, I've spoken about, I mean, if I was to deteriorate in the same way as my parents, I've uh, I've said to them that I don't want them to feel responsible for me. I don't want them to, you know, feel that they've got to, you know, take me into their homes and only if they want to do. Um, but if they've got, you know, their lives are full and they don't want that, then I'm very happy. I'm very happy to go into the actor's home. <laughs> I think it's called Denvil Hall. Um, so so <laughs> I said to them, put me there and I'll be very happy. Mm. And how did they take those conversations? Did they, they take them seriously? Or? Oh, yes, I think they were probably hugely relieved. Right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I know that's not for everybody. I know, um, you know, there are many people who want to care for their parents and want their parents, in, you know, to be in their own homes and, and look after them. I, you know, I have several friends who have done that. Mm -hmm. And I take my hat off to them because you need a lot of patience and it's um, as particularly with Alzheimer's. And it's, um, it's a hard job. Mm. Do you think about what your legacy will be? <laughs> 
Well, if I have a gravestone, but I do want to be cremated, but if I had a gravestone, I've taught that I quite like a tick on it and job done. <laughs> nice, I like that. Is legacy something that's important? Um, not really, no, no. I think we're all ashes, really. And um, it's better that things keep evolving and new things keep happening rather than keep looking back at people and things and events and keep moving forward. Jane Horrocks, thank you so much for coming on the Marie Curie couch and sharing your stories and I've loved meeting you today. Oh, thank you very much and you too. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website, mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye.